Every rail fan has a favorite steam excursion star. Whether it's the Streamline J-Class 611, Big Boy 4014, Coal Hauling 2102, or even an excursion star on smaller short lines like New Hope 40 here. It'd be fair to say we have quite enough to keep the momentum going, especially with some former excursion stars being slowly returned to their former glory like Pennsylvania Railroad K4-1361 at Altoona, Pennsylvania. Heck, there's even steam rising back from the ashes like T1-5550 or projects in Britain like Tornado. Sadly though, not all of America's excursion stars are still with us today. As some were scrapped due to being in poor condition, being lost and forgotten about, or due to flat out negligence by their owners. Today, we'll be taking a look at five American excursion stars that couldn't escape the scrapper's torch. For this list, we'll be looking at preserved steam locomotives that were set aside for preservation and pulled at least one or more excursions before meeting their end, so locomotives like BNO EM1659 won't be on this list, as that Yellowstone was set aside for static preservation at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum in Baltimore not to be operational, but was scrapped due to a mix-up in communication. With that cleared up, let's go down the list. Number 5. Chicago, Burlington and Quincy 5632. Yeah, I know you probably saw this one coming. In the 1930s, the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy, or just simply the Burlington route, was seeing an increase in traffic and wanted a stronger steam locomotive class. So the railroad ordered 8484 locomotives, numbers 5600 through 5607, from the Baldwin Locomotive Works and classified them as 05s. The CB and Q were satisfied with the locomotives, and that led the railroad to build an additional 28484 locomotives, classes 05As, in their own West Burlington, Iowa shops between 1936 and 1940, using the engines in fast passenger and heavy freight service. A few, including 5632, would be converted from coal to oil fired in their later career, being reclassed as 05Bs. After dieselization took hold of the Burlington, the railroad's own president, Harry C. Murphy, decided to host steam excursions to celebrate their history, being one of the first railroads in America to do so. Even the Reading and n &W hadn't started on such an idea yet. 5632 and another engine, 01A Class 282 Mikado, number 4960, became the shining stars of the program both figuratively and literally. What do I mean by literally? Well, in 1964, during the 100th anniversary of the opening of the CB&Q's main line between Chicago and Aurora, Illinois, 5632 gained the title of the world's biggest brass model when she was painted gold to commemorate the occasion. Now I see where the brass model idea came from in model railroading. Runs were made on May 20th, 1964, and on May 23rd. The May 23rd trip consisted of a record number of passengers, about 3,500 in total, with over 22 coaches being used. By June, 5632 was once again back in her normal livery, but would turn gold again to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the opening of Kansas City Union Station, with a trip to St. Joseph on October 31st, 1964, and a trip to Bevere, Missouri on November 1st. This run, though, proved to be 5632's final excursion, as when she returned to Galesburg, she was stored unserviceable, and then, in 1965, a Class 3 overhaul was authorized by Murphy as her flu time had expired. The CB&Q shop forces at West Burlington had removed the flues and fire brick. However, the CB&Q was unable to recruit the 14 men that were required to put 5632 back in service. To add insult to injury, Harry Murphy retired from his position as CEO in 1966, and Louis W. Mank succeeded him. 
This, though, was like trading out the Claytor brothers of Norfolk Southern for James Squires, as Mank had no interest in an excursion program, seeing it as unnecessary, and he ended the program stalling 5632's overhaul. 5632 was sold to a man by the name of Richard Jensen, along with a boxcar full of parts. The engine was moved to the Chicago and Western Indiana Roundhouse for storage. The railroad at one time used the roundhouse and yard to provide Chicago terminal services for the Erie, Monon, better known as the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville, Chicago and Eastern Illinois, Wabash, and Grand Trunk Western Railroads, all of whose trains terminated in the Chicago and Western Indiana's Dearborn Street Station. After the demise of steam on these railroads, Mr. Jensen was able to rent a stall in the roundhouse for most of his stuff using another engine, Grand Trunk Western 5629 to begin running excursions. Richard Jensen would maintain and operate his locomotives based out of this roundhouse. 5632 was obtained in dismantled condition with no flues and no stay bolts in the firebox, and despite three boxcar loads of parts, including CB&Q's steam shop equipment, there was still more than $100,000 worth of labor needed to restore it, and this was in 1966. Today, with inflation, that's over $919,784. In 1969, the presidency and control of the CNWI had changed, and Richard Jensen knew that his time at the roundhouse was almost up, since it was soon going to be scheduled for demolition. Knowing that his lease for space at the roundhouse would not be renewed, Jensen spent most of the summer moving stuff out of the roundhouse and into freight cars, but because it was in the middle of a major rebuild and therefore difficult to move, 5632 remained in the roundhouse. At 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning, Western Union arrived with a telegram from CNWI that Jensen had 48 hours to vacate the premises. In other words, get the f off my property! But Richard had no means to do so. After 60 days of waiting, no inspection of the equipment was performed by CNWI, and no movement took place. Suddenly, though, the railroad moves all of the equipment, including the 5632, in a special move to the 88th Street Yard. Jensen waited until his lease expired, then asked the CNWI when the move of his equipment was going to be completed. In return, they sent him a draft for $4,800. He then makes a call to the Chicago and Northwestern, as well as the Chicago, West Pullman, and Southern Railroad, in an attempt to find out if any attempt was being made to inspect the equipment, and is informed that efforts to inspect at his request were denied by the CNWI. After three more weeks, the equipment is suddenly moved to the Ehrman Howell Scrapyard at 83rd Street, but sadly, the 5632 derails during the move into the scrapyard on a switch. While it's not said how bad the derailment was, we can assume that it was minor, but with no way to get the engine re-railed, she was just flat out scrapped where she stood. Right before the scrapping took place, Jensen filed a lawsuit against the CNWI. Originally, the suit requested delivery of the equipment and payment for deprivation of use. When 5632 was scrapped, Jensen refiled the suit asking for full repayment of value of his engines, including the now scrapped 5632, railroad cars, and the equipment contained therein. Jensen would eventually win the lawsuit and was awarded $707,007.49 plus a million dollars in punitive damages. All that money at the cost of a once golden excursion star. Thankfully, CB&Q 5632 has surviving sisters to carry her legacy onward, four in total. Those being 5614, who is on display at Patty Park in St. Joseph, Missouri, 5629 at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden, Colorado. <laughs> golden, get it? 5631 at a depot in Sheridan, Wyoming, and 5633 at the Douglas Railroad Interpretive Center in Douglas, Wyoming. What about the 4960? She's now operating excursions on the Grand Canyon Railway in Williams, Arizona. Number 4 Grand Trunk Western 5629 it shouldn't be too much a surprise that this Pacific would make it on the list too, much like the previous selection. 
as this locomotive has been immortalized on the internet as one of the most tragic tales in steam preservation. But for those that don't know the story, let me explain. Grand Trunk Western 5629 was a 462K4A class built by the American Locomotive Company, or ALCO for short, in 1924. It was the third member of the class, numbered 5627 to 5631, which were copies of the United States Railroad Administration's Light Pacific design. The only difference was that the USRA Pacifics had an all-weather cab. 5629 had a pretty average career with the Grand Trunk, pulling commuter trains through the lower peninsula of Michigan and northern Indiana, as well as freight trains in its later years, you know, typical mixed traffic stuff until the Grand Trunk decided to replace their steam fleet with diesels. 5629 would be bought off the railroad by a familiar guy by the name of Richard Jensen in September of 1959. Oh boy, here we go again. The locomotive ran a few excursions around the Chicago area throughout the 1960s, as well as being in charge of the Schlitz Circus Train for two years from Baraboo to Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1967 and 1968, respectively. The success of her career didn't go unnoticed, as Southern Railway President W. Graham Clater and Southern Steam Program leader Bill Purd in 1968 took note of the Pacific. They arranged a business meeting with Jensen in Chicago, with the hopes of purchasing the 5629 for use to pull their own excursions within the southeastern United States, while cosmetically altered as a Southern Railway PS4 class. However, Jensen arrived at the meeting extremely late while covered in soot and grease from working on the 5629. When Clater and Purd made the big offer to purchase his locomotive, Jensen declined, believing it was worth an unreasonably higher amount. As fate would have it, Jensen would pay for this mistake. In 1977, he broke his back from slipping and falling while trying to help a friend move a refrigerator to a third floor apartment, landing him in the hospital for several weeks. This made the rest of Jensen's finances dry up, as he could no longer afford to pay rent to store his equipment, nor run any more excursions. He subsequently approached several railroads in Chicago for permission to store the 5629 on their property, and after several of them told them to scram, Jensen reached an agreement with the Rock Island Railroad to store the locomotive in the deteriorating roundhouse in Blue Island, Illinois, only to be moved again in 1979 after the roundhouse was scheduled for demolition. 5629 was moved toward the middle of the Rock Island's Blue Island freight yard, where she would sit for the next seven years. But once again, fate was not on the engine's side. Rock Island went bankrupt the next year in 1980, and Metra took hold of the former trackage, including the yard. Metra was allowed to use the Blue Island complex, but the problem was they couldn't move the 5629 because she was owned by Jensen. They asked him to move the engine to the nearby Iowa Interstate Railroad so they could turn the complex into a car shop, but they would not provide any assistance in getting the locomotive there. Jensen agreed, but when he was preparing to move the locomotive, he noticed many critical moving parts were either stolen or damaged. It was said such vandalism was done by Metro employees who were later sacked. That's when Jensen had an idea. If he didn't do anything, and the locomotive was scrapped, he could sue Metra for damages more than what the locomotive was worth. It worked before with another engine, so why not? Word of the situation spread fast, and several individuals and organizations, including the Illinois Railroad Museum, offered to take the engine off of Jensen's hands, and Metra even supported the proposals, but all were denied by Jensen. Metra, fed up with Jensen's antics, went to court, and the ruling was, if Jensen didn't find a way to remove the engine from their property, nor get it movable at all, then 5629 would have to be destroyed. 
Metra tried again by trying to seize ownership of the 5629 so they could donate it to a museum. But the court said despite being on their property, it was still owned by Jensen, so they couldn't really do that. Then they had no choice but to ban Jensen from the property, because as it turned out, Jensen couldn't care less about the engine, as he was even selling parts of the engine off to rail fans, which explains the decrepit appearance, not to mention Metra feared that as a result, 5629 could become a safety hazard if too many parts were sold as souvenirs. On July 1st, 1987, Metra was given the court order to scrap the 5629, so they reluctantly sent a salvage team contracted by Erm Man Howell Scrapyard and cut the 5629 where she stood, much like CB&Q 5632 earlier. Rail fans could only watch on in horror and sadness as the once proud Pacific was taken apart piece by piece. Rail fans grew in enough numbers to say their goodbyes that Metro Police had to shoo many off the property and confiscate the film rolls of those who were trespassing, making photos of the event quite rare. Unsurprisingly, Jensen sued Metra and lost the case. There's a lot more to this story that had to be left out for time's sake, but I do plan to make a documentary telling the full story of 5629. If you want to read more about it, there's a link in the description. You can also check out History in the Dark's video on the topic too. It should also be noted that Metra themselves didn't want 5629 scrapped in the first place, which was a rumor many rail fans started saying that Metra hated steam and wanted it gone. But the truth was, Metra had tried to save the engine multiple times, but there was nothing they could have done to save the engine thanks to Jensen's idiocy only cared about the money of the lawsuit he planned to win instead of preserving a well-beloved locomotive. As karma would have it, Jensen was no longer well-liked in the railfan community after the incident, rather deservedly I'd imagine. He would eventually pass away on March 16th, 1991. While it's a shame the 5629 is no longer with us, making the class K foray of the Grand Trunk Western being extinct due to Jensen's ignorance, her relative, Grand Trunk Western 5632, a K4B class 462. Wait a minute. Coincidence? I think not! Survives to this day and is on static display in Durham, Michigan. There's also Grand Trunk number 5030, another Pacific, class as a J3B which is currently on display in Jackson, Michigan, but will eventually be moved to the Colbertdale Railroad in Boyertown, Pennsylvania for restoration to possibly operational condition. Number three, Norfolk and Western 2174 and 1240. We're putting these two wildly forgotten excursion stars of the Norfolk and Western together because both share very similar stories. So let's start with the literal elephant in the room. 2174 was among 30 Y6B class 2882 Malay articulated steam locomotives built at the Norfolk and Western's own Roanoke shops between 1948 and 1952, numbered 2171 to 2200. They were used generally for freight service, slugging out heavy trains on grades, such as coal drags, but they even ran on timed freights, which is unusual work for a Malay-type locomotive. Moving on to 1240, she was one of 43 Class A 2664s, built around 1949, also by Roanoke Shops. It pulled similar trains, to 2174, but of course the bigger 2174 could pull more than the 1240 could. In 1959, after being replaced by diesels, number 2174 and 1240 pulled a pair of farewell to steam excursions alongside J-Class 484611, who actually pulled the very last one. Shortly thereafter, 2174 was sold to a Roanoke area scrapyard where she would sit for 16 years, thanks to an old manager, 
and a soft spot for steam engines. 1240, though, sadly was already scrapped by 1959, right after retirement. 611 was lucky, as she was donated to the Museum of Transportation in Roanoke, Virginia, and is still at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Stroudsburg as of the making of this video. The Roanoke chapter of the National Railroad Historical Society did make an attempt to save 2174, but the asking price was $10,000. That was going to be a hard goal to reach, especially back then. As fate would have it though, the head of the fundraising project eventually passed away, as did the old scrapyard manager who had been protecting 2174 this whole time. He was succeeded by a younger manager who couldn't be bothered about preservation, and when the deadline came and went, she was cut up by 1976. While it is a shame that the last Y6B couldn't be saved, a distant relative of 2174 still survives, and that's a Y6A, 2156. She is currently on display at the Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri. There's also Y3 Class 2050 at the Illinois Railway Museum, so the history of N&W's malaise isn't forgotten, thankfully. As for 1240, her legacy survives with a sister, 1218, who is not only the sole survivor of the A-Class, but is also the only surviving 2664 locomotive in the entire world. That's quite an honor to behold for 1218. We could go into detail about 1218's excursion career, but if I did, we'd be here all day, and we ain't got time for that, okay? We got other things to talk about. I'm sorry. It was an eventful one, though, let me tell you, especially alongside the likes of Southern 4501 and J-Class 611. Today, though, 1218 sits on static display at the Museum of Transportation in Roanoke, Virginia. And as for 2174, well, at least she got to be on the cover of Trains 12. Well, that's something, I, I suppose. I miss her. Number 2. Central Railway in New Jersey 774. The first and only Camelback to be featured on this list. CNJ 774 was one of 10 L7As 460 Camelback engines numbered 770 through 779, built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia between 1913 and 1914. They were virtually identical to the L6As and L7 class Camelbacks, but had a slightly bigger firebox. Interestingly, the enlargement of the grate resulted in a very modest increase in the firebox heating surface. 774 among most of the other Camelbacks, including those on the rival Reading Railroad, would serve this on the CNJ on pasture service until they ceased steam operations in the mid 1950 The locomotive ran a few farewell trips down CNJ trackage until 1955. After the excursions were over, a man by the name of Don Wood tried to convince the CNJ to donate the 774 for preservation after retiring it from the excursions. CNJ, however, disagreed, stating that they already donated another Camelback, a 442 Atlantic number 592, and the box cab diesel switcher number 1000 to the BNO Railroad Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Another CNJ steamer, 060 number 113, was also sold to the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company for extended service. They felt they had done enough for preservation, however, CNJ did offer to sell the engine to Wood for $5,000 with flu time. Sounds pretty cheap and a nice deal, but remember, this is 1956 we are talking about. Nowadays, with inflation, that's equivalent to over $54,443. Yikes. Alas, the doctor is too poor to buy this. Sadly, Wood was unable to raise the money in time, and the 774 was cut up, making the L7 class camels officially extinct. All that survives of 774 is her number plate, which was given to Don Wood after it was scrapped. Ouch. I mean, it's great something survived of her, but wow. As of now, the whereabouts of the number board are currently unknown. 
While it is a shame that 774 couldn't be saved, we can at least be glad CNJ bothered to save engines like Atlantic 592, as well as other engines like Boxcab 1000, and even CNJ 113, the only operational CNJ steam locomotive left, who runs periodic excursions under the Railway Restoration Project 113 organization out of Minersville, Pennsylvania, via Reading and Northern Trackage. Did they do enough for preservation? It's hard to say. But it's the best not to argue about it. Well, at least 774 survived in model form. Before we get to number one, let's list some honorable mentions. Southern Pacific 4274, an AC-11 class cab forward that was retired by 1956, fired up for a farewell excursion the next year, only to be scrapped right after. Illinois Central 2613, a 482 Mountain that pulled the Louisville and Nashville Centennial Excursion Train on October 14, 1959, and after that trip, it was put up for sale and offered by the Illinois Central to the Kentucky Railroad Museum, who turned her down for having no room, so it was cut up. And finally, there's Union Pacific 3967, a challenger that was chosen to run the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club excursion in 1953, operated its last revenue train service in 1957, stored in a roundhouse after retirement, then scrapped by 1963. If you have other excursion stars that were scrapped, please put them down in the comments. Also, if you want to see a part two of this list with the honorable mentions as well, then please leave a comment asking for one. But now, let's move on to our number one pick. Number 1. Buffalo Creek and Gauley, number 17. If you were expecting an interesting choice for number 1, you haven't been disappointed. Please note this Mikado is not to be confused with Old Slobberface, aka 280, number 4. 17 was built as Savannah and Atlanta 504 by Baldwin in September of 1925. After being retired by the railroad in the 1950s, 17 was sold off with three of her sisters to the Elk River Coal and Lumber Railroad being renumbered as 15 through 17. All three would also end up under the hands of the Buffalo Creek and Gauley Railroad pulling occasional coal and lumber loads. Seven more years of service, 15 was scrapped in June 1962. 16 was retired in 1959, but not scrapped until 1974, while 17 pressed on. She was sold in April 1963 to the Lavona, Avon, and Lakeville Tourist Road in New York where she served on excursion trains. Tragically though, three years later, 17 developed mechanical issues as age quickly caught up to her, namely problems with her firebox. According to a Railroad.net forum email from E.H. Blabley on May 25, 2004, in retrospect, this locomotive was an unfortunate purchase. It had seen hard service in West Virginia, moving slack coal from the mine tipple to a gob pile. We doubt it received much attention, and in particular, it didn't appear to have received any regular boiler washes. After 17 was pulled from service, they bought another engine, former Huntington and Broadtop Mountain 280 Consolidation No. 38, which interestingly had a former PRR E7 tender. After 38's arrival, 17 was later sold to a Rochester businessman who sold it for scrap. Even if a locomotive gets a second chance at life through preservation, sometimes things don't always work out, and the engine still finds its way back to the scrapper's torch. But we can all agree that we should be grateful that many steam locomotives still survive today, as either museum displays, or even pulling excursions, whether they be on tourist lines, or even out on the main line. As for these fallen locomotives, as long as their memories remain fresh in some people's minds, they surely will never be forgotten.
Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, then leave a like, comment down below, subscribe, whatever you want to do. I would also like to personally thank the following users, Ryan's Colorado Rail Productions, History in the Dark, Train Guru, and Texas County Rail Fan for lending their voices as guest stars in this video. Go check out all their channels, they have some great stuff to offer. Links to their channels are all in the video description. I would also like to dedicate this video to my girlfriend, Firewolf. She's been going through a lot lately. But just remember, it's not just me that'll always be here for you, but my whole community, my whole army of like 111 or something thousand subscribers. As always, take care, we'll see you next time.